This video is part of the sequence in a first course in modelling, analysis and control. And here we're going to focus on discrete systems and the zero order hold. So far then we've looked at discrete signals and we've basically demonstrated that they can be represented by a series of impulses. However, real systems do not produce sample data and nor is the input to a real system a series of impulses. So if you look at a real system, it tends to have a continuous output and a continuous input. So what we need to do next is consider the interconnection between a computer world with sampled signals and a real world with continuous systems and dynamics. Some practical issues then. We cannot deploy impulses on real systems because they cannot be realized in practice and anything approaching an impulse is likely to cause damage as it's like hitting an object with a hammer. For real systems, the input signal represented um, down below by U of S should be smooth and continuous, and a discrete signal is clearly not continuous. So how are we going to combine our discrete signals with real systems based on continuous data? So here's the answer. The most common tool for converting a discrete signal back to a continuous one is called a zero order hold. And this hold basically means we keep the most recently received value. So if a computer outputs a series of impulses, that's what you can see here, a series of impulses, then the zero order hold converts this into a staircase. So you can see we keep the most recent value until we receive a new value. And then when we receive a new value, we keep that value. And when we receive a new value, we keep that value. And so your reconstructed signal is a bit like a staircase. Now, as long as the sample rate is fast enough, the staircase nature of this is unlikely to be problematic as this approximates to repeated small steps. How then are we going to implement a zero hold? From a physical arrangement point of view, a zero hold is implemented as in the figure below. You can see we've got our discrete signal here, U of Z, that goes through the zero order hold and that gives us the staircase or pseudo continuous U of S, which is then fed into the system G of S. Now, if we combine all these elements together and look at how the whole system works, this is what we have. We have our zero order hold here and you can see with the discrete signal going into the zero hold and the continuous signal coming out, that continuous signal goes into your continuous system G of S, which gives a continuous output Y of S. That Y of S is then sampled. So we've got our continuous signal here, and then we have our sampled signal here. The computer does something, whatever it does, and outputs another sampled signal, U of Z, which goes to the zero to hold and gives us our staircase signal for U of S. So how then are we going to realise the zero order hold? It's one thing to have a pictorial representation of how we're connecting the discrete and continuous worlds, but we need to represent this mathematically so that we can do systematic design and analysis. Here we're going to then show mathematically what is going, hold, going on. So a zero order hold holds the most recently received value. So if you look here, you can see that between time naught and capital T, we keep the value which we got at time naught. So this is the value we keep. And then when we get to the first sampling instant, we discard that value. And now between time T and 2T, we take the new value, the time that was taken at T. So you'll see the key values here I've used the star to represent it's the sample data. It's y star 0 between 0 and t, y star t between t and 2t, and then you can see y star 2t between 2t and 3t, and so on. So this is what's going on. Now we need a mathematical formulation to represent this. And what we're going to do is use some of the knowledge we've already got. What you can see is the reconstructed signal is comprised a lot of constants. Now, constants are represented in a plus using a form something like A over S. But the other thing we've got is actions coming in and out. 
and we know that the term, the delay term, e to the minus snt, tells us something that, you know, basically when an action kicks in. So if we use these two components, we should be able to reproduce our desired signal. Here then is an example. So we're just giving you the answer. So we're saying if you look at this signal here, y star of zero being the value, and then I'm going to multiply that by 1 minus e to the minus st over s and ask what happens. Well, if you do 1 over s, that corresponds to a signal like this, okay, coming in at time 0. If you do e to the minus st over s, that corresponds to a signal which is delayed by a time t. Now, what happens if you subtract one of those from the other, then what you're going to end up with is a signal like this. OK, so it has a value of 1 between 0 and t and then goes back to 0. So you can see this is exactly what is going on here. The only difference is, of course, we're all multiplying by this value y star of 0. So this operator h of s achieves what we want. It gives us the staircase bit for a single impulse. What do we do then when we have an impulse train? So a whole series of impulses which was usually represented with this sum here, sum from k to infinity, ykt, e to the minus skt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that by the zero order hold which I've just defined. So if I expand this out you can see I've substituted the zero order hold here into my impulse train. And then you'll notice we've got two delay terms. We've got the delay term in the zero order hold and the delay terms that come from our impulse train. So if I rearrange this, we get this form here. And the key thing you want to look at is this bit on the right hand side. e to the minus skt minus e to the minus sk plus 1t. So basically begins at kt and ends at k plus 1t. So you can see the action comes in e to the minus skt after kt seconds and then because of that minus sign you then cancel it at k plus 1t. So it's evident that if you now look at this in, in fine detail you will see that this signal w of s if you were to do the inverse Laplace you would end up with the property or the staircase that we want. So a zero to hold with a sample time t has a simple mathematical representation. h of s equals 1 minus e to the minus st over s. And in essence now, if you implement it like this, this is what you're going to get. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to basically draw a big line round here. And we're going to say that now we can call this g of z. So if you combine your zero to hold with your g of s, well, almost actually, I've missed a bit. Um, we also need our sampler. I think that's coming on the next page. We also need a sampler. So examples of discrete transfer functions. Having built the core blocks of sampling in the zero to hold, we complete the mathematical framework by producing an equivalent discrete system transfer function. So here you can see I have put the sampler in. So essentially, if I draw a block all the way around these three terms, in essence, that block gives me g of z because you can see I've got a discrete signal coming in and a discrete signal coming out. So the discrete system combines the zero order hold, the continuous system and the sampler. So you need to recognize that in practice, a discrete system has got all three components. So the next question is, how are we going to find these g of z's? So we're looking for a discrete model of the form y of z equals g of z u of z. And what we know is this. We know the continuous time relationship. So that y of s equals h of s, or my zero order hold, times g of s times u of s. Now, I can actually represent this 1 minus e to the minus st as 1 minus z inverse, because z to the minus 1 is equivalent to e to the minus st. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say if I wanted discrete understanding, I'm going to try and find the Z transform of the bit that's left, which is G of S over S times U of S. And that will now give me Y of Z. Now for simplicity, what we're going to do first is we're going to take U of S to be an impulse. So U of S is just one. So this is just for derivation purposes, because if U of S is just one, then straight away, we deduce that y of z must be equal to g of z, and therefore g of z is given by this formula here. 1 minus z inverse times the z transform of g of s over s. So let's give some examples. I've given you a g of s here, 1 over s plus a, and I want to find g of z, and I'm just using the formula we've given. So it's 1 minus z inverse times the z transform of 1 over s, s plus 1. Now when we've done z transforms, We've done Z-transforms based on signals, not based on Laplace. So first, I need to convert this into a signal. So I do my inverse Laplace, and you can see I've done partial fractions to extend that term, this term here into its partial fractions, and then I can reconstruct it into a signal, 1 minus e to the minus at, and now I can do the Z-transform. So Z-transform of 1, gives me 1 over 1 minus z inverse, and z transform of the e to the minus at gives me this. And then finally, I can combine that all together, and there's my g of z. So you can see these steps are somewhat tedious. You can see I've got to do a, a partial fraction expansion of my Laplace transform. I've then got to do the inverse Laplace to get the time domain signals, then convert each time domain signal into a z transform, and then combine all those z transforms together to get my final form. This is rather tedious. Now you can do it very quickly with MATLAB and there's some code and the key part of the code is this one here, this function C2D, which stands for continuous to discrete. Here's a certain example and you will see the same point. So there's my transfer function and my definition of G of Z, 1 minus Z inverse times the Z transform of 1 over S, G of S. So the first thing I've got to do is my partial fraction expansion of the Laplace into forms in the table, and then inverse Laplace to find those as functions of time, as you can see here. And once I've got them as functions of time, I can now use my table of Z-transforms to find the corresponding Z-transforms, and there we are. And then I have to combine all those together to get my transfer function G of Z. And again, we're going to emphasize this is tedious. You really don't want to be doing this in pen and paper. So although you might want to do a few examples to understand the key steps, in practice, you're going to use something like C to D on MATLAB. So some conclusions. We've introduced the concept of a zero order hold to ensure that a real system has continuous inputs and continuous outputs, and shown how a zero order hold can be represented by a simple mathematical form such that one can form an equivalent G of Z. So the equivalent G of Z basically combined the zero to hold the continuous system G of Z and the sampler. In general, Z transform operations and the computation of G of Z are tedious, so this is best handled by computer.